Good morning, everybody. My name is Will Schmier, and welcome back to another episode of the Level Survivor Podcast. Today is July 27th, 2023. Not sure why I said the date, but there you go. That's the date. It is the end of July, almost the start of summer. I am pumped because that means the kids are going back, or sorry, it is the end of summer here in Florida, and the kids are going back to school very shortly, and I could not be more excited. It's been a great summer. Just had a little trip down to South Florida with the family. It was great. But I I cannot wait for them to be out of the house. I love them. They're great. They're amazing. But Daddy needs a break. And Mama probably does too. Anyways, before we hop into this week's episode 24 of the podcast, we are going to just circle back on a couple of things from last week. So I haven't recorded or I haven't uploaded the video for the podcast last week, but I am in the process of uploading all of the first 22 episodes of the podcast audio to my YouTube channel. It is youtube.com slash at lovable survivor. That is going to be the channel for this particular show. So all previous upload episodes will be uploaded. Hopefully by next week, I will probably upload the video from last week's podcast just so there is an actual video on the page. I'll do that this week while I upload and edit sort of not really, I'm not really doing a ton of editing, but getting this video that we're recording right now in order for early next week release on YouTube just get everything caught up so that we're on a regular cadence anyways yeah so that was exciting the audio sounded pretty good last week not amazing a little hot on the microphone if I'm being honest but you know things are things are cooking things are working so I'm pretty pleased with the overall first recording so again welcome to episode 24 of the podcast and this week we're going to be talking about Anxiety and dealing with, you know, that may be, well, dealing with anxiety and kind of, you know, some, some tips for coping with anxiety, because if you're anything like me, I didn't really have a ton of anxiety in my life besides the fact that I'm a father of three, you know, it wasn't really until my stroke hit that everything sort of bubbled, bubbled to the to the forefront. You know, a lot of things I buried deep down and everything kind of came to the surface when I had my stroke. So I've never been officially diagnosed with anxiety. I will say it, even though I wish I wouldn't have to, but of course you need to talk to your own medical team, medical professionals, I'm just kind of sharing my experience and how I handle things. You know, results may vary. I'm definitely not a doctor. Don't even consider me a doctor. I'm just kind of bringing this up as a topic. You know, like a lot of things, just building that awareness that that kind of pointing out things that I didn't think about early on that really sometimes didn't surface till year two, two or three have have yet to surface. Although I feel like everything has started to slow down in terms of things coming up, but there's always something new. And so again, it's, it's, and anxiety comes in all shapes, sizes, forms. It does not discriminate. It is very similar, I find, to imposter syndrome. You could be doing something for 20, 30, 40 years. And even though you think you're a pro, you're not. Or or you, you think you're a pro and then all of a sudden you find yourself getting nervous or awkward or, you know, just just that little angel and demon on your shoulders. Something just kind of pops up. It creeps out of nowhere. And anxiety is very similar. There are lots of forms of anxiety. There, You know, for me, 
I'll touch on the ones that I'm most familiar with and the ones that have kind of crept into my life since my stroke. Definitely, I think I've talked about it on this podcast, but social anxiety, I never really had that growing up. Maybe a little bit when I was younger and very insecure, but by high school, I just became kind of the big guy. So that was never really something I dealt with a whole ton. You know, I just, I was always kind of funny, but also smart. So like my friends loved me because they, I could help them in school, but I would make them laugh. And it wasn't, I'm not saying it was easy by any means, but I sort of found a way to get around a lot of social anxiety. You know, I was a big drinker. I, I've said that before on this podcast, I said it last week. Drinking and smoking, not the best habits, but they they help me bond with people. Um, you know, I also enjoyed them. I'm not going to sit here and lie. You know, do something for a long time. But looking back, I think probably, you know, things like I got into smoking cigarettes. I think that was a way of me kind of coping with anxiety and I think drinking probably as well. And so again, it takes all forms, shapes and sizes and particularly after stroke. I'm trying to think what else, you know, I, I, I've said this before too, but it's, uh, you know, social situations that I don't necessarily want to be in it's very hard to know if it's social anxiety or if it's just me being me i am an introvert i have extrovert tendencies but i'm definitely riding that middle and leaning towards introverted i don't really love being in large groups that's for sure and i think you know we talked about this last week too on the podcast Traveling can produce a lot of anxiety, can produce a lot of overwhelm. I, I think anxiety and overwhelm kind of go hand in hand. And, you know, that line is a little blurry, if I'm being honest, sometimes I think I think we can all probably agree on that. And, you know, there are, again, there's many forms. There's, there's social anxiety, the fear of interaction, how these fears can be fueled. It could be with, it could be in our own head. And it's not like make believe. It's it's really something we're dealing with. And I think, you know, very similar to the social anxiety is that we, as stroke survivors, we most of us probably remember how things were before we had a stroke. You know, I remember everything. I remember how I walked, how I talked, how everything felt effortless. You know, even even towards the end when I was very big and really, you know, I was aware that something was wrong. Like I was not in good shape. I was really just there, there were a lot of signs that now in hindsight all obviously point towards potentially having a stroke. But at the time, I was unaware of these things. You know, but back to the insecurity thing, I think a lot of stroke survivors feel insecure because we remember how things were. We probably liked how things were. I know for me, I was able to go a million miles an hour. I was able to do everything myself. I never had to ask for help. And that's, you know, that those are things we all struggle with. Even, yeah, as I'm talking on this podcast, I, like I'm remembering to slow down, to breathe to relax, to do all the things that were very natural, very easy, very effortless. And over time, hopefully with practice, with time, I know time, every, everybody says time heals all wounds. I don't, yes, but also no. <laughs> also how much time? Yeah, so these insecurities and changes in our physical abilities and our physical appearance you know, for me, a little bit of speech. You may, you, there are people that, you know, have their sp speech completely shattered. There are people who have physical abilities completely shattered. I mean, that think about that first year for me in a wheelchair for most of that time. Even now, you know, I just worked out, I ran 
about a half marathon today, which as, as usual, you could see <laughs> my hoodie is completely soaked. It was a different color to start the day, but I'm thinking about it. And I was walking through the grocery store before I came home to record and I'm walking and I'm just, it's just not the same. So these, these, you know, you can call the fears, you could call that anxiety. It's just, it's so many shapes, sizes and forms, but it's this, these, I don't want to say you just have to get over it because that's that's not fair. That's kind of unreasonable, but it is sort of a process to get there and to realize, you know, I wrote a tweet earlier today and I'm thinking, I feel like from probably that first year on, like it, at the end of 2020, I felt like I was at like 85% recovery, but I feel like it's been that way for this whole time now. And so... You know, I tweeted it out, and it's, this is kind of ties to the anxiety and and sort of how I cope with things. Like even at eighty five for eighty five percent, eighty five ninety percent of fully recover, you know, fully recovered. Who knows? But I feel like I I'm okay with that, and I'm still betting on myself every single time. Like I'll take me. At 85, 90% or even 80%. Shit, I'll take myself at 75% and I'm taking myself over most people in a lot of scenarios. So, you know, uh, I'm okay with that. You know, you may not be there yet. You, you navigating post stroke anxiety and understanding and overcoming is, is, it's a process. And, you know, you hear people say that a lot. And I feel like when I hear people say that, I kind of brush it off because I hear often I hear it from therapists, whether it's occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, you know, doctors. It, it, I rarely hear it from other survivors. And when I do, that's when it sinks in for me. It's like, okay, that's another person who knows what I'm going through. It may not be exactly what I'm going through, but they know how hard it is to deal with all the things and the anxieties, you know, whether that's, again, we'll, we'll dive more into the different types of anxiety, but like, I get that they get it. And that makes me, you know, part of the reason that I want to do this podcast and start doing these videos and putting the episode videos online is so that people could see another stroke survivor, not just hear another stroke survivor. I don't think anybody thinks that I'm not, you know, but like if you were just browsing the podcast, you may not realize, you know, when you look at me and I get this a lot, and this gives me a shit ton of anxiety. People always say, oh, well, you don't look like you've had a stroke. You know, and I do appreciate that because I understand where they're coming from. And that's great. That means I'm doing a lot of work. And the work that I have done already is, is starting to take shape. It's not perfection. I don't even want perfection. I just kind of want to feel the way it used to before my stroke. And I know that's a wild pipe dream sometimes and it may never be that way. But it does mean to me that I'm I'm getting closer. But it also drives me crazy because people don't understand how much work we as stroke survivors do to even just, you know, to appear as though we are the same. And, you know, that gets me anxiety sometimes because it just drives me crazy. You know, and t oddly enough, I didn't mean to segue into it, but, you know, driving anxiety. I had a lot of anxiety about driving. And I still have some anxiety when I'm driving. I'm fully licensed. I feel good. I feel safe. I feel secure when I'm driving. But it is still not the same as it was before. And I think a lot of my anxiety is heavily tied to Remembering how I felt before the stroke. And I think a lot of us might feel that way. I can't speak for everybody, but I, I it's it's a tendency I see when I speak to people, when I go to therapy and I see other survivors and I meet other survivors, you know. It's just it's just so complicated and it's so complex. You know, there's financial anxiety. I mean, I I was fortunate of when everything happened, things just Things for me were different, but not everybody's so lucky and not everybody has access to, to good health care. And, and, you know, some people, maybe all they have is they've had 
a brief stint in in an inpatient rehab, and then they were told they had to leave because because their insurance wouldn't cover it anymore. Or you know, and who knows how good they were? I mean, they were hopefully safe, but you know, they don't usually send you home if you're not complete, you know, relatively safe. But like, you know, it's just a lot of work, and then people are. Again, another one of the many reasons for doing this is that there are some resources, there are some other great channels, there are some that I've talked about at nauseum. There's some other great books written by survivors, but the reality is there aren't tons and tons of resources because honestly, you know, I think as stroke survivors, there are different pockets and different segments of 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 healthcare different survivors trying to do things and help a wider, you know, community, but like everything is kind of siloed myself included. I mean, I I have to reach out and try to talk to more people to bridge those connections, you know, because even though somebody might be doing something great, they're only able to help so many people. And I think by, by putting these things on YouTube, hopefully that will, you know, just having more resources available. It seems so silly that there's so many people that have so many great things to say and share, whether it's information or exercises or, or something in between or accommodation, you know, all the resources we can get people because not everybody has the financial means, but they probably have internet or some level of internet access and they're able to at least get on YouTube and, you know, Nothing is perfect on YouTube, but it, it starts a conversation. It, it brings up awareness for people, you know, because think about how often are people not even aware of certain things. You know, I always go back to like last year at age 39 when I, I really learned how to breathe properly through my nose, which is something I had not learned for the first 39 years of my life. You know, I've had a relatively, you know, I've not had the toughest upbringing. I, I'm now 40 years old. I've had access to a lot of things, you know, middle class, upper middle class times, but still like, still there were things that like, it blows my mind when I find out something that I'm just not aware of it, you know? So yeah, just thinking about that. But again, there's so many, so many different types of anxiety. And I think, you know, the last main one we'll talk, I'll touch on right now is the recovery anxiety, like, you know, thinking back to when I first had my stroke, I was very optimistic about how things would go. And over time, that sort of, that reality set in that it was going to take longer and it was going to be longer. And then, you know, you start doing the work, you know, but the results can be slow at times. And it didn't matter that I was 37 when I had my stroke. I mean, there are people that are younger, there are people that are older. And, I, and, and honestly, there are people that are older who were in pretty good shape for older people and they were pushing 70 and they were up and walking around weeks after their stroke, you know, and they had their stroke around the same time as me. I remember one guy, you know, I won't mention his name, but there was a guy that I went to the, he and I were at the same place for inpatient. And then we wound up being at the same place for outpatient a little further down by my house. Really nice guy, early seventies was a runner. You know, and he was up and running. I mean, he was running within three months. I haven't seen him in a while, but, you know, I, I just remember being so frustrated because people would tell me, oh, you're young. You'll be, you'll, yeah, you know, and there are lots of truth. There's a lot of truth in the fact that I'm young because I have some advantages. I, I, I have a little bit of drive, not even by choice. I just have children. You know, I'm a, still a, a younger parent. I'm not retired. I I basically, honestly, I don't want to say I'm in the prime of my life, but I'm in, you know, I just turned 40 last year. I'm definitely in, in the middle, right? You know, and you, you think about returning to work, which I think we're going to do another episode on in a couple of weeks. Because I, I, I want to kind of revisit that one I did early on in the year. Because... This, there's been some questions about returning to work and it's getting off track, but you know, recovery anxiety and it, you start, it starts to sink in after a little while after you realize, okay, this is going to be longer. This is going to be more difficult. You know, 
I think back to that first month of January of 2020 when I got released from inpatients first time before I went back to the hospital with that MS diagnosis. But like I was not in good shape when they released me. You know, and it, honestly, it sounds weird to say, but a, a blessing of, you know, I'm glad it wasn't a second stroke. I'm glad it wound up being MS. I think, you know, who knows how I would have felt if it was a second stroke. But either way, I kind of feel very lucky to have gone back to inpatient rehab a second time right before COVID because I feel like I really need more inpatient work. And, you know, that was very apparent when I got there the second time. And I think that really helped sort of. It gave me an extra 30 days of inpatient work where I was able to just do the work and really, I don't want to say forget about everything, but it gave me, it just let me focus on the work and it gave me more time to push, push, push in terms of starting to open up my hands, starting to fix my speech, you know, because outpatient is great, but it is slower and less intense and there are things you can do at home and that's fine. And it's good, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's definitely slower than inpatient. So inpatient is very much, it's much more intensive work. And for me, being younger, you know, at the time I was 37, that did help with some of my anxiety because I felt like I, that second time in rehab was giving me more of an opportunity to get a little further ahead than where I was when I left in January 2020. You know, but uh, either way, it's challenging. It's a lot of work. I don't think that anxiety really, it can go away. And it can, it, you know, you, you start to learn tricks and tips and techniques to deal with it. And I think it's kind of none of it has been crystal clear for me because I was working with an actual mental health professional when I was at inpatient rehab, but then obviously when I came out, COVID happened, everything got weird. So I wasn't able to work with that individual because she wasn't set up to work online early on. And so I kind of, I tried a couple things. I tried working with people, but it just, it, I, I, you know, to be fair, what I really needed at that time was somebody who was a mental health professional who had worked with stroke survivors previously. So long story short, I didn't work with anybody for a little while, but I started, you know, I was reading a ton. I was at work. I did go to outpatient therapy. It was like one of the very few things open to do physical therapy and occupational therapy and kind of just talking and meeting with other people. I was kind of able to get resources, books, and look into things. I spent, I think a lot of us during COVID, but especially having my stroke right before COVID on lockdown, actually, again, another blessing. Weird to say, but the timing of COVID really helped my recovery because, <laughs> because, <clears throat> Because the world slowed down for a couple months, even in Florida, it w I was able to slow down enough to take the time to look into things. And one of the other things that I've done since my stroke is kept an open mind about everything, whether it was anxiety, neurological, you know, different, you know, neurodiversity is a hot topic right now. And being that I survived a brain injury, which is, you know, stroke is brain injury. And then having MS, it's, it's all brain related stuff. Really keeping it open, open mind, talking to doctors, talking to, to, to all doctors, you know, from cardiologists, which primarily deals with heart. But, you know, he's seen enough stroke survivors and, and people with MS. Or people, you know, I, I thankfully didn't have a heart attack, but it's kind of all intertwined. And so just all these things and then, and, and COVID was isolating as a stroke survivor for all, you know, 
I, I really didn't go beyond my family for a long time. For lots of reasons, you know, so I just, I really dug into books. I started doing research. I was in a way that I've never done it before. And some of the, some of the reasons I did it are because again, I do have children. I wanted to figure it out. I saw that the pandemic was allowing time to like really dig into things in a way, had it not been the pandemic <laughs> that that was in 20, you know, most of 2020 and part of most 2021, maybe I wouldn't have. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of reading books, you know, people say, people say X, Y, and Z about books and, and hearing other people's stories. And of course, what works for me doesn't work necessarily for you, but it's like you, you got to keep reading to find these things and like, oh, okay, this person tried this. Maybe it doesn't apply to your situation, but it gets you thinking. It gets you, your mind <clears throat> active, you know, which is a big thing with a brain injury. You want to keep an active mind. It's actually having a stroke is not much different than retirement. You think about people that retire and people that often you hear stories of, of people that retire, but they don't really retire. And I feel like that is kind of the same thing with brain injury. It's like you have a stroke. You do want to keep your mind active and working because, you know, if it, if you're not, it's just, it's, <laughs> I don't want to say it's a use it or lose it thing, but it kind of is a use it or lose it thing. And if you don't keep putting in the work, and you lose hope, you know, things could take a turn. I, I don't know that for sure because I, I honestly, I put it, I keep putting in so much work that I'm probably overdoing it, honestly. You know, but again, going back to anxiety, there's so many, so many different types. There's other things like you might have anxiety about you, your relationship with your spouse, with your partner, with your family. You know, these things all change. Relationships change. You know, I think we've all learned that through the pandemic, but also just as you get older, you kind of realize, well, these, these, these relationships that were important or, or maybe they're still important or maybe they've changed and that's okay. But also you can feel, you know, I know I, I was, I was kind of think it's me being an introvert, but also it is kind of isolating and people, you know, I try to be funny. I try to make jokes. But a lot of people don't really understand how isolating it can be. And I'm not even sure I would be this aware of it if my wife wasn't deaf. Because I see how isolating her world is and how people misunderstand her and misinterpret and just kind of brush things off. And honestly, it happens a lot to me too. You know, but I'm 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 more... I don't know that I deal with it better, but I, I feel like I deal with it better because I'm not looking for people's approval. Not that my wife is, but like, she's a different than I am. I, you know, I want people to kind of like me, but I also kind of don't care. You know, my wife is very different in that regard. So, and honestly, most people are probably like that. Like, I just, I think it's just a thing that you develop when you're six foot eight, 325 pounds is that just feeling isolated or abandoned or, or anything. They're all valid feelings. They're just like, they're not things that I really care about. <laughs> In fact, I was just talking about it with somebody. Oh, I know. I was joking at the grocery store with the, the woman who, who works at the checkout, who I, who I love, who I see there all the time. Again, I'm not going to drop her name, but she's, she's somebody that I, I know from the nearby Publix who I see all the time. And we do. I've seen other things outside of Publix, so we know each other. I would not say we're best friend. <laughs> she knows not enough about my life, and I know about enough about her life to say we know each other pretty well. But I forget where I was going with that. But there, there was a point to that story. But I've completely forgotten what that was. You know, and again, going back to the family dynamics of, of, of after stroke and anxiety, 
you know, there are other concerns that people might have. Like, you know, I always feel this. I don't want to be a burden to people in my life. This is a big one for me. I feel I ask for a lot of help now. And I hate it, but I know I have to do it. But I also hate it because, because let's be honest, you know, my wife is amazing. My kids are amazing. Everybody's getting a little tired of dad asking for help. Here's my problem. You might experience this as well. I was so used to doing everything and going a hundred miles an hour that when you have to, when you can't do everything, and you have to start asking for help. You have, I had to realize I can't ask people for help at the speed at, with which I was doing things in my life. I'd be going 200 miles an hour. My wife is amazing, but she can only handle like one or two tasks a day. I, I want to do 50,000 things. And now I need help with. 25,000 of the 50,000 things I want to do in a day. So I, I do, I have a lot of anxiety with things like that. I know if it sounds silly, but these, you know, it's, it's part of the process. I've really, some of the strategy, strategies I have, and again, I'm not a doctor. I have no idea what your experiences are or your limitations, but like, I just try to push myself a little further each day in a in a super safe way. Like I don't want to harp on this, but like I won't do it, but I can't do it safely. I'll give you a good example. The you know, I'll talk about this anxiety. When I was a developer prior to my stroke, I worked on the computer eight hours a day. When I worked out, I worked out after hours, you know, but it was pretty clear up until my stroke. I worked behind a computer all day, writing code, leading teams. And then my hobby, my main hobby outside of work was woodworking. I loved woodworking. I bought this house because of the garage, because I planned on becoming a YouTube woodworker. I mean, I loved it. There's so many great channels. It's something I plan to get back to one day. I still haven't really got back into it the way I was into it. One, because I'm not fully, fully capable. If I'm being honest, like there are, there are, you know, I could definitely do beginner woodworker stuff. The problem is I was at a level, I was not a professional woodworker, but I was definitely high mid-level woodworking like i had pretty i had bought the first tool in some cases i'd bought the second ver like the next level up here here we moved here i planned on really outfitting the entire garage shop to be a basically a youtube woodworking studio and so i i'm like in that mid to high level kind of upgrade of tools but I was doing pretty complex projects and one of the things I've struggled with is getting back into it is going back to the basics which this again is a little off topic from anxiety but it is a very important thing for stroke survivors to to know and to remember and and it's a struggle honestly and I guess I do have anxiety about this because it's like, I don't want to go back to the beginning, but I have to go back to the beginning with a lot of things, whether that's typing, handwriting, woodworking, you know, not, not everything like, you know, my speech is pretty good, but I did have to go pretty far back to the you know, reading like four letter words, five letter words, six letter words, and just kind of increasing that difficulty. And sometimes you have to go back to the beginning and you could rapidly gain traction to the middle, but in some instances where like woodworking involves a lot of coordination. So like hand-eye coordination, writing, you know, things that I all, all, all took all for granted. But uh, 
Yeah, my point is the only reason I haven't gotten back into woodworking again is still because I, I feel like I can't do it safely 100% the way I really enjoy doing woodworking. But that is a long-term goal. I, I'm not in a rush. Woodworking is, for me, it's a hobby that you could be 10 years old or you could be 95 years old. And really, as long as you're able to see and do things safely, it's one of those hobbies that you really could. It spans the entire age range, basically. But I do, I think that's the thing, you know, like, I, I don't know what you'd call it necessarily, but it is a form of anxiety is like, well, you know, what am I doing? You know, you think about getting, if you are somebody who's getting back to work, you get back to work. You know, what about the things you like, like love to do prior to your stroke that were hobbies? Can you do those? Do you have to work? I mean, it sounds so strange to work work on getting back into a hobby but if you really loved it you know like woodworking i really loved it and i i i still i you know yeah I, i'm not doing complex cuts but i am starting to slowly do little projects around the house and it may be because i'm older now and a lot of my woodworking started out of necessity when we bought our first house i built everything and it was fun and it's still fun, but I, I'm not, I'm definitely not doing complex projects yet, but I'm getting there. And it, it, that is for me a long-term hobby and goal, but uh, you know, and that's, that's sort of my coping, you know, I don't want to get into coping strategies too much, but I mean, cause it's going to be different for everybody, you know, but coping I think one of the, you know, a lot of us as stroke survivors, I think part of the, the way we cope with things is that you do sort of over time, once, it, once you realize that certain things are just going to, they, they may be off the table forever. So it's, it's coming to terms with that. It's also, you know, then you realize, okay, this is something I would love to get back into, but there's not an immediate need. So it does go to the back burner, like woodworking. Like I don't have a absolute necessity to do something. And if I did, I could probably walk my wife through it. And assuming it benefited her in some way, she would help me do it. But yeah, like always, stroke is not a linear, not a linear path. I know that sounds so corny, I'm, I'm, but it's hard, you know, and it's, again, it takes so many different shapes and sizes and and it does pop out of nowhere honestly like there are things that always surprise me like i feel like i've got a pretty good grasp on a lot of things and then all of a sudden i'll get caught off guard like i said with imposter syndrome but with anxiety too definitely catches me off guard i'm aware of a lot of it but yes it's uh, yeah I, I know what I have a, an issue with. It's and I'll just I'll I'll kind of leave this there. You know, one of the things I was, I think I did talk about this last week. But I love making people laugh. I love people. I love making people spit out their food when they're eating or a drink. And I have a lot of anxiety about general. Like, I feel lucky. Really, to be to be a younger stroke survivor and have a lot of my faculties still, you know, my mind is pretty sharp, but I'm not as quick as I used to be. And that, that really bugs me. And I have a lot of, you know, generalized anxiety. And I'll be honest, too. I, sh I should have said this from the early start. So when I had my stroke, obviously, I was 37 years old. They put me on an antidepressant and I'm still on it. And I know a lot of people talk about these things these days, but, uh, you know, I never, it's, it's centrally, it's not a high dosage, it's just a little bit, but 
And it doesn't matter because I've actually tried to up it. I've tried it lower. We, we've kind of played around with it a lot, but I, I had no problem with it. I have no problem talking about it. But I think it's really critical because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to know myself if I wasn't on it. You know, I was never diagnosed with any, any anxiety. I think they put it on, put me on it, and I agreed with them at the time. And I still do because I'm younger. Because, you know, I think anybody is liable to go through something difficult like a stroke or brain injury. You're, you're definitely susceptible to all sorts of emotions and feelings. They could be all over the place. And in fact, they were probably all over the place. And they probably still are in some, some cases for me. I just feel like over time, things have helped. But yeah, I think when it comes to any kind of anxiety, whether it's social anxiety, driving anxiety, financial anxiety, recovery anxiety, just general anxiety across the board for any survivor of a stroke or brain injury, I will tell you my best piece of advice, 1,000% without a doubt, is... Keeping an open mind, because everything I thought I knew growing up as a kid from the Northeast, especially in the New York, New Jersey, you know, tri-state area, growing up there, we can have a tendency to think we know it all. And I think a lot of people at any age across the country can have, tend to think they know it all. But realizing you may not know it all, especially when it comes to stroke, because nobody's really preparing to have a stroke. So I think if I'm being 100% honest, just keeping an open mind has really helped in the mental health and anxiety space for sure. And I think across the board, if I'm being honest, but like I was never into meditation. I could never meditate prior to my stroke. Had my stroke, all of a sudden I figure it out. But I think a lot of things that helped was I kept an open mind because I think I heard things that I'd never heard before. I'll give you a good example. And then we'll end up end this show. But with me, for me, my mind was always racing. I never was able to slow it down because my mind would always be racing. Now it still does it. And I still do it all the time. I want to go a million miles an hour. If, if you haven't noticed, that's pretty clear on this episode. But. Because I just knew I didn't have the answers for this. And I was, I, nobody told me this. I just kind of realized it's like, all right, I want to listen to doctors. But even I knew, I knew doctors and nurses, they had seen thousands of patients who've had a stroke, but they haven't had the stroke. They've seen patients, so they have a good idea of what to, to how to direct us. But they don't really know. So I just have always kind of kept an open mind. I've tried different things. I've tested different things. You know, I've talked about it in earlier episodes. I tried, you know, medical marijuana wasn't for me. There are other things I might try down the road. I've tried just so many things. And I think, you know, getting into breathing has really helped. But I'll tell you, like I said, keeping an open mind. I never heard it prior but I had my stroke and I opened the calm app and I don't, I, I have no idea why I never heard it on the calm app before my stroke. But when I, after my stroke early on, I heard just lay down. All right. This is specifically meditation that you could sit up. You can lay down. Doesn't matter. I laid down cause I was like, all right, I'm going to lay down. And she says, just let your mind race for 10 minutes. And I did. And, and it raced. It raced for 10 minutes. I was like, is this meditation? Come back the next day. Try it again. Same thing. But like the third day, though, I start. I just kept sticking with the app. I kept doing 10 minutes and I had no expectations. I just let my mind race. But eventually it slowed down. And I think probably, I don't want to say it was like 21 days to build that habit because it wasn't, you know, probably somewhere in the first week, I was like, all right, I realized my mind was slowing down. Sorry. <laughs> if you're watching this podcast, you're watching me. Ugh. 
my nose is running. Yeah. So like I, I just eventually my mind slowed down. I just kind of breathed slowly and listened, got into meditation. I've been doing it for probably three years now. I don't do it every day anymore, but I do it like probably five times a week for 10 minutes. Really easy. You know, you, you, you think 10 minutes is a while and then you start to, you know, you go through something like this in life. You're like, yeah, I got 10 minutes to try to meditate. What's the worst that happens? Uh, 10 minutes I lay down or sit down or sit up and I just try to turn everything off for 10 minutes. Yeah, that's not the worst 10 minutes. Not, not the worst way to spend 10 minutes. So I don't know. I was able to build up that habit. And I think that in turn led to breathing. And I, I, I really, you know, I put an emphasis on focusing on my mental health all my, you know, general health. I've been working out. I've been eating right. These are things I wanted to change before my stroke. I didn't do it soon enough. Unfortunately for me, I had the stroke. Hopefully you don't. But if you or somebody you know has, you know, maybe, maybe you, you, you do, you know, the great thing is if you're a stroke survivor, you do have the opportunity to change, you know, change those maybe bad habits, change habits that you weren't able to change or or just take advantage of things that you never thought you would be able to. You know, and it's, uh, again, it's different for everybody, but I think those things worked for me. I'm, I'm glad they have. You know, I have tons of other suggestions. Again, breathing is a really great one if, if, if meditation doesn't work out. I like an app. It, it just kind of forced me to to get into it, it helps, um, you know, but try different things. So again, that my biggest recommendation is just be open to, to a variety of things, learn about different things, stay curious. You know, you hear that a lot. I think staying curious as a survivor is a really big thing. Anyways, I'll leave it there in terms of anxiety for this week. Let's see. Let's talk about a couple of fun, random things. Some good shows on Hulu this week. Ryland's back. I don't know if anybody, what is the name of that? I don't know. It's like Ryland in the city. I would look it up, but I don't feel like it. Anyways, a couple of cool shows on Hulu. I was watching. Uh, what's the one with Wrexham? Yeah, that's kind of a cool show. I don't know if they've done another season, but that's very cool. That's the Ryan Reynolds soccer team that he and uh, the other guy who I'm forgetting from Philly, they bought the team over in the UK, you know, a lower level team, definitely interesting, cool show. I know I, I had been seeing it around a lot of Wrexham stuff, but I didn't really know the story. Cool show. Check it out. Let's see what else. Went to South Florida last week on a little uh, tour of a university with my daughter. That was fun. Yeah. I haven't been to South Florida in a while. I forgot how much I love and hate South Florida. We were in the Broward County, which is always, Broward is so different than than Miami-Dade. Two different worlds. Very strange. We were in Delray, which is a nice little getaway. I love Delray because it's not Boca. It's not, it's not West Palm. It's not Fort Lauderdale, thank God. It is not Miramar. It's not Miami. It's just. This little slice of heaven in South Florida. But yeah, we ran into a bunch of people who were not the greatest. I just forgot what kind of swagger you need down there in South Florida. I could still have it if I cared. I just, yeah. I don't know. It was a guy's nice trip. I had fun. I do not miss South Florida. I, I think. I am a North Florida boy from here on out. Yeah, it's just weird. <laughs> Never disappoints to be the most amazing people watching in the world. But yeah, I, I'm just, I'm over. Overall, Florida, or South Florida. But I will, I will plan a trip to Miami later this year that I am looking forward to because I've not been down there in a long time. Actually, that's not true. I was there last year. I have not, no, correction, I have not been to the part of Miami that I want to be in, which is Coconut Grove, downtown and Brickell. Yeah, so I have to plan that. New Heights podcast is a great podcast. Travis and uh, Jason Kelsey, 
which is not new, but I, I, yeah, I just, uh, they're hilarious. They're awesome. A great show. Burkcast as usual is amazing. Two more recommendations. I have not finished Titan because it is an 850 page book, but it is really, really good. And now I remember why Dax Shepard kept recommending it over and over on Armchair on his podcast. It is a really good book. I, I just, you know, boy, Rockefeller is a complex individual. I'm only like 10 chapters in. It is, God, it is long. So I'll probably be re- reading that for the rest of the year, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but it is really good. He's, yeah, just so many good things. I'll have to take better notes so I can bring them up next week. And then the last thing I'll mention, my favorite comedy. I love Bert. Bert is the man. I love Tom Segura. But Jim Gaffigan is a is a one of a kind. He has released his 10th special on Amazon Prime. A little bit uh, different. Really good. I love Jim. I love it. But but I'll be honest, it is a little, it is a different vibe. I, I really liked his last special, Comedy Monster. This one is just as good. It is Dark Pale. I, I think it's weird. <laughs> maybe I just, I'm going to watch it again, but maybe he does a lot of darker humor and he's wearing a black suit the whole time, so... It actually, it's funny because I'm also pasty and wear black a lot of the time. And I, I love making jokes about really dark topics, which he does. So I, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, I guess it's just not the bright, cheery, kind of playful gym that I'm used to. It's still good. It's great. I definitely highly recommend it. It is just, it's just a little different. And it's not bad. It's not good. I mean, it is good, actually. It's, uh, yeah, it's just different. It's just not, I don't know. He's got some great bits in there. <laughs> he, he and I apparently are, ex- we must have been lost. We're like long lost brothers. Yeah. He's got some great stuff on Starbucks, and I feel the same exact way. And I've felt this way for a very long time. I'm just mad that he did a special with all these great jokes that now I will never be able to do, but yeah, I feel like my inner voice, (laughs) I feel like Jim Biafigan is my inner voice sometimes, actually, if I'm being dead ass honest. I love Bert. Yeah, Jim is like, Jim is definitely, like he's like the devil on my shoulder. Like When I hear myself getting annoyed at life, I hear Jim Gaffigan as the voice narrating things that are annoying me in life bird is more of like bird is more of like my other show that i used to do that i'm bringing back that i'm going to start working on this week bird is like that look bird actually i'm glad i have this podcast name before bird bird i love him but he's kind of like that lovable idiot and it's that is why i'm also the lovable idiot yeah (laughs) They're very different, but they're also very similar in a lot of ways. Actually, that's great. That's, that's, yeah. I was watching an older episode of the Burkcast with Jim Gaffigan. Watched a bunch of Jim Gaffigan stuff this week, including his special. So go check out Dark Pal out on Amazon Prime. Really good. Highly recommend it. I think that will just about do it for this. T- Navigating post stroke anxiety, understanding and overcoming episode 24 of the Level of Survivor podcast. My name is Will Schmier. Thanks for joining in. Bye for now. Oh.